Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Lisa Christensen, President and CEO of the Alaska World Affairs Council. It's such a pleasure to be here today to feature Mr. Nathan McCowan, who will be speaking about exploring indigenous, indigenous political frameworks within the United States, Alaska, and Canada, a comparative look at nation-to-nation -nation relations and economic development. It's four degrees in Anchorage. It feels like minus three, but the sun is shining and I hope it's warm and cozy wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Please do let us know who you are and where you're calling in or joining us from in the chat function. Say hello to us and the speakers, and we're so glad you're joining us here today. Today's program is part of the Evangeline Atwood Distinguished Speaker Series. We have a lot of great programs coming up on our list in person and in virtual. So please go to our website to find out more information. We'll play the slide deck at the end. You'll see some snapshots of some of our great speakers coming up. The Alaska World Affairs Council is part of 90 plus councils around the United States in the World Affairs Council of America network. And we've been in Alaska longer than Alaska has been a state. We welcome everyone here to join in the conversation at the end during our Q&A after the presentation. If you're currently not a member, please do think about joining the Alaska World Affairs Council to support these unfiltered, nonpartisan, non-political programs like the one we're featuring today, where you can directly hear from and ask questions directly to global thinkers and leaders. We are having, like I said, a lot of programs coming up. They're not all on our website yet. We're adding more all the time. So please do join our email list We'll send you information about programs that are popping up, like our program coming up in the spring with Ambassador Kenneth Brightwaite, the former 77th Secretary of the Navy, also on the Arctic. You don't want to miss it. We also have World Wiz, which is moving to a drive-in movie and trivia night in February. Stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll be pulling that Alaska Airlines raffle at the time. You can buy your ticket on our website if you're in the state of Alaska, and we hope you win those tickets to go somewhere exciting in the world. Today's program is gonna have about a 30 minute presentation by Mr. Nathan McCowan, and then followed by a question and answer period. So if you would like to ask a question during that time, anytime during this program, raise your hand. If you want to ask a question, I'll call on you and bring you up on screen, or you can type in your question in the Q&A function and I'll read that if we get time. And right now, I'd like to hand over the microphone to one of the board members of the Alaska World Affairs Council, Ms. Hallie Bissett, who will be introducing our speaker today. Hallie, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. And I'll just echo um, you know, Lisa's request. If you're not currently a member of the Alaska World Affairs Council, please do consider joining the organization. It gives you kind of unfettered access to, to some people that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. Otherwise, Lisa does a great job with these events. We're very grateful for her hard work on behalf of the organization. It is my great honor today to introduce to you um, my good friend and uh, my boss, really, uh, Nathan McCowan. He is the current president and CEO CEO of St. George Tana, which is an island out in the Aleutians in the Aleut region. He is both Aleut and uh, Clinket, and also a member of the Champ champagne uh tribe in the First Nations. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. But, you know, Nathan, like, like me, probably needs to join board members anonymous. He's on several boards. He serves on my board, the Alaska Native Village Corporation Association. He serves on the Alaska Federation of Natives board. He serves on various other boards throughout the community. Um, he has led our organization, um, you know, through a really hard time in the past year to our Supreme Court win. He was one of the small handful of leaders that um, took the reins and led us to a successful conclusion. So uh, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce you to uh, Mr. Nathan McCowan. Nathan, take it away. Thank you, Hallie. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you to the Alaska World Affairs Council. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak to you on a very interesting topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, given the amount of time we have, I'm going to go ahead and, and get into it and, uh, to start off with uh, a presentation. You know, uh, 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 before I do, I want to introduce myself uh, in our traditional manner. Uh, um, 
Kuhun Yadi Ayachad. My name is uh, Nathan McCowan. I'm a member of the uh, Kiryakadi, the Koho clan from uh, Southeast Alaska. Our, our original place was in uh, Kudahu, which is an abandoned village just south of Yakutat. Uh, my grandfather was Anungan. He was from St. George Island. Uh, he uh, uh, was adopted into the Dakhuedi, uh, which is my great grandfather's clan from Klukwan. So I'm happy to be here. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to share what is you know, our traditional uh, way of uh, departing information, which is a PowerPoint presentation. So let me, uh, let me just call that up here. Uh, so uh, exploring indigenous political frameworks within the Alaska or the United States, Alaska and Canada, you know, a relatively small uh, topic, something that I should hopefully be able to get through in about 30 minutes. Uh, this, I was joking with some of the, the folks beforehand, uh, this is a very uh, lengthy topic and, and I hope I can do it justice in the uh, short amount of time that I have here. Uh, so what's the, what am I going to talk about? I want to talk about uh, a little bit of history and context, uh, move on to what, what are things today, a uh, little, little bit of evaluation, comparison, and then just some idle speculations about the future. Uh, Hallie shared you a little bit about my biography, but hopefully this will give you a little bit more background into uh, why I have a unique perspective. Um, so my day job is I'm the president and CEO of St. George Tana Corporation. That's the village corporation for St. George Island, where my grandfather is from. I'm also a shareholder in Aleut Corporation, the regional corporation uh, in the uh, Aleutian and Pribilof Islands region. Uh, through my grandmother, who's Clinkett, um, I'm a Sea Alaska shareholder, the, Villa, the regional corporation for Southeast Alaska, as well as a Gold Belt shareholder. That's just on the Alaska Native Corporation side. Additionally, um, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Central Council of Clinkett and Haida Indians of Alaska on the Alaska side of the border. I'm also enrolled as a citizen of the Champion Ashek First Nations on the Canadian side of the border in the Yukon. Uh, my grandfather's, my grandmother's grandmother, uh, was born in what is now the Yukon. Uh, back then, it wasn't even the Yukon. Um, she was born before the Alaska border uh, was finalized. And so our family has, uh, you know, maintained those, those relationships, maintained uh, our, our uh, interest and involvement um, in after the border came down uh, later on. Finally, as Hallie said, I, I do serve on a few boards. Um, I'm the uh, chair of ANDCA for the village corporations. I also serve on the board of Sea Alaska Heritage, the nonprofit uh, for Southeast Alaska. Um, I'm the village representative for AFN from the uh, Aleutian and Pribilof Islands, and I've served in the past as the chair of the Champion Ashek Trust. Now, the trust is probably something unique to the folks in Alaska, and I'll explain. Um, uh, apparently, I'm. I apologize. I. Uh, not sharing this, the slideshow. Let me uh, let me do that now. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, I'm as I was saying, I'm the shareholder of all of these corporations. I'm enrolled in uh, these two entities. And I'm a member of these particular boards. The trust might be something new for folks in Alaska. And so I'll get into how that works in the Yukon a little bit later. And then finally, um, I'm also a member by, well, I'm not a member of the Metlakatla community, but I'm a descendant. My great great grandfather was uh, one of the folks that came over with uh, Father Duncan in the late 1800s. So I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, details and a lot of experience in these areas. So hopefully that'll give me a little bit of credibility, even if my credibility is shot. Uh, because I can't operate the PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, so before I get into the rest of the presentation, I feel obligated to make a few quick disclaimers. This is a little bit like uh, the genie in Aladdin when he was trying to explain the rules. Um, what I'm going to talk about is an extraordinarily diverse, extraordinarily complex uh, number of arrangements over a very long history uh, across an entire continent. So uh, being able to say too many things uh, without generalizing or overgeneralizing is hard. So please bear with me. Uh, uh, there's a lot to, to talk about in a short amount of time. There's 574 tribes just in the US, 229 in Alaska. There's 189 Alaska Native corporations. There's 630 First Nations in Canada, 14 in the Yukon. So a lot of a lot. 
Um, the, every single statement I'm going to make is going to be wrong for at least one of them, and it's going to miss out on at least one of them. Uh, the data to talk about all of these entities um, is uh, uh, woeful in some areas, incomplete in er other areas, uh, spotty in other areas. So it's, it's, again, hard to talk about everything in a comprehensive manner. I'm going to do the best, best that I can. Uh, we're in a time of transition. Um, the nature of the political relationships in the United States between the indigenous uh, tribes, the ANCs, the federal government is in transition. Um, that's that same thing is happening in Canada as well. So what is true as of today, as of December 3rd, uh, could very well be uh, not true in a year, two years, five years. So I'm hoping this presentation will uh, will not be embarrassing when I look back on it uh, in some period of time. And then a, a bit of a restatement of the diversity uh, comment, exceptions are the rule. Um, every single one of you uh, may very well be able to say, well, hey, I know somebody over there that had this one thing. You're probably right. Uh, I knew this person who said that their tribe worked this way. You're probably right. Uh, again, there's so many entities that are involved in this presentation. Um, there's not any one rule that binds all of them. So let's get into it a little bit. Um, this is the point in the presentation where I wish I had uh, one of those cool uh, voiceover actors, you know, in the beginning, you know, there was a world uh, where the natives were hanging out and they were eating things and doing stuff. But I got to pick an arbitrary point in time. And so this is the discussion on the US side, 1787. 1787, as though you know, is when the constitution was ratified. And that really began the relationship between the United States and the indigenous people uh, that were here before the United States was founded. Uh, there's the Indian Commerce Clause uh, inside the Constitution that that definitely laid out the the basic framework of how the how the United States was going to think about the Indians as separate uh, sovereign people. And that started to 1828, the first era of uh, Indian policy in the United States, the coexistence era coexistence in the sense that uh, the United States was not yet forcing the Indians out of their lands. There were small scale conflicts, but the, the United States was still the 13 colonies, still very much located um, east of the Appalachia Mountains. Um, and you didn't see the, the type of conflict that was yet to come. They were trading, they were you know, forming relationships on the frontier. Uh, if, if there was conflict, it was on a much lower scale. 1828, for those of you that know your history, is also the year that uh, Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as president, or was elected as president, inaugurated in 1829. And that began the era that most of us think about when we think about uh, Native affairs in the low 48, the removal and reservation era. This is the era where the United States greatly expands all the way to the west coast of the United States, California, Oregon, Washington, and pursues a protracted agenda of removing the indigenous people from where they are, putting them on reservations, isolating them for the purpose of being able to expand with the population, be able to expand with settlers as you go west. Um, this is this is all of the, the toughest parts of the United States history um, uh, as re re regards uh, First Nations, because this is this is really where the genocides that, that took place in a number of areas occurred. Now, keep in mind that in the background, a number of the First Nation numbers in Canada, about a number of the, the tribes in the United States had already gone through very large depopulations as a result of epidemics. And so this era was aided and abetted by the fact that the populations were weakened. Many of the tribal structures were already weakened. In 1886, um, that really begins a, a, a new era in, in uh, well, before 1886 and 18, 1871, and this really matters for Alaska, treaties stopped being uh, approved by Congress. Congress unilaterally said they're done making treaties uh, with uh, in Indians or tribes in the United States. And this really mat matters when we get to the Alaska portion of the timeline. 1886, the Dawes Act happens, and this starts a new era of the United States where the United States official policy is to assimilate the, uh, to the natives. So many had died off, so many had been pushed out, uh, the populations had dwindled so much that it stopped becoming something that was sort of a day-to-day -day, uh, aspect. And so the United States changed its policy to just, let's integrate these people. We've stamped out their ability to exist as separate populations. 
and let's bring them into the mold. Um, that lasted through 1932 through FDR's administration, and they began to realize how ineffective that assimilationist policy really was. Indians didn't want to be like everybody else. So what they started doing is realizing that they needed to, to help them uh, form their own governments and make their governments functional in the places where they were. And so the reorganization era is a lot of creating constitutions, boilerplate constitutions from the BIA and uh, uh, allowing the, 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 the tribes to start uh, expressing their, their sovereignty over their lands again. Through 1945 though, at the end of World War II, we take a little bit of a step back um, the termination era is seen as a point in time where the United States begins wanting to completely slough off any of its responsibilities to the, to the tribes. They want to, they started eliminating recognition to tribes, they started eliminating reservations. And so you see this peaks and valleys approach uh, to, to, the, uh, to the policymaking of the United States. Canada, you'll see parallels, not the same, but you'll see parallels. And then finally, the era we're in today is self-determination. Uh, this is now a rejection of the termination uh, uh, era, just like the reorganization was a, a rejection of the assimilation era. Self-determination now is primarily defined by uh, the individual tribes having uh, the, the resources, the abilities under the law, also financial to be able to govern themselves again. For, in, for the programs that have been uh, run by the federal government to be taken back by the tribes and run by the individual uh, uh, tribal nations themselves so that they can make the decisions on the best allocation of resources, policies, programs, and such. Putting the tribes more on a even keel with the states within our system of federalism in the United States. Now, this next box is all about the Alaska situation. Alaska enters into this entire stream of events and because of that, entering into it, it was, it was deeply influenced by these stream of events. In 1867, Alaska is purchased from the Russians. Uh, there's a bit of a quotation marks about the purchase for if you're an Alaska native. And, but in, until 1929, land claims begins. Well, the, the reservation era was over. No treaties had been able to be signed because Alaska natives didn't even know that, that Alaska had been purchased. By the time we realized exactly what was happening in the gold rush and later eras, by that point in time, Congress had already said treaties are off the table, we're moving on to assimilation. Uh, 1929, uh, and this is a bit arbitrary, you could say that it really started in the 1910s with the uh, Mento Flats chiefs who came together in Fairbanks. I'm picking 1929 because it's my presentation and my great grandfather was involved in the uh, A and B Grand Camp in 29 that decided to sue the government for uh, restitution on our on our lands in Southeast Alaska, and that really began the land claims movement that culminated in 1971 in Anxa. Now, Anxa has a lot of properties of both self determination as well as properties of termination. Anxa itself was not an agreement between, not a treaty. It was not a treaty with the tribes. It created this brand new uh, set of institutions, the corporations. Corporations were granted the land. The tribes, the inherent sovereignty was not extinguished, but some of our rights as native peoples were uh, primarily our hunting and fishing rights. So it, it has elements of both. Um, if Anxa had happened 20, 30, 40 years beforehand, if it had happened 10 years after, it would look much, much different. Now, for many folks, oh, and finally, the uh, tribes of Alaska are formally recognized and listed in 1993. They had always existed, they'd always been there, but the process by which the federal government actually enumerated which ones would be recognized happened in 93, and that uh, was a big portion of helping bring funding to the state and be able to uh, uh, take over a lot of the programs I described that have previously been run for us by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Health Service, et cetera. So in a parallel universe over here, and this is the result of what we're looking at right now in the United States, the original United States, and then these spots of pink are what's left of the reservation lands. Um, this map, and I couldn't even find the most current map that includes it, this is how much things are in flux. This map, particularly in Oklahoma, is flat wrong right now. There was a Supreme Court decision last summer, the McGirt decision, that, that restored all of this area of Oklahoma to the tribes and said that the reservations were still in existence. So this map would need to be you know, recolored if it was accurate today. 
And then Alaska, for some laws, all of it is treated as Indian land, even though the only reservation technically is down here in uh, Annette Island for the Simshan. Um, all of the uh, uh, Anxa lands, the 44 million acres of Anxa lands that the ANCs hold all over the state are considered as Indian lands for some laws. Um, some parts of Alaska are considered Indian lands that have no, uh, that have very little ownership by the ANC. So Alaska would be a bit of a hodgepodge here. Moving on now to talk about Canada, and you'll see parallels because Canada has been greatly influenced by the United States and its treatment of its, of its populations. Uh, Canada, we started in 1764, but this really isn't the Canada we know. 1764 is when the British defeat the French, the Treaty of Utrecht is signed, and the French cede uh, their colonies uh, in the, around the St. Lawrence River to the British. Um, from 1764 to 1812 was really an era of alliances between the British colonies, the British Crown, and the First Nations in Canada. Remember that a number of the First Nations uh, fought against the United States, the Revolutionary War, uh, that the British had used a number of their allies in order to uh, help bring about a certain amount of peace with the Quebec situation. And so it was, it was very much a, 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 set, a set of allies working together. From 1812 to 1867, you start seeing the expansion, but slower expansion of Canada moving out from the St. Lawrence River Valley into the Great Lakes area in particular. And you have a series of treaties that start being formed uh, with the First Nations as the settlers start moving west. Uh, these treaties uh, basically preserved hunting and fishing rights, a certain amount of land for the natives to the First Nations to use on their own, and uh, started the process of assimilation. Canada moved into the assimilation program much earlier than the United States and much heavier than the United States ever did. But Canada didn't have the same type of outright warfare that the United States practiced against its, its first, uh, the indigenous peoples. 1867 is when Canada is actually founded. Um, the, the current nation state that we know of was Canada. And you would think that being the progressive uh, idealist type of place that it would be, that it would you know, have a completely different system from its colonial heritage and how it dealt with its First Nations. And the short answer is no. They, really go after assimilation, and they start this process of the number treaties. And I'll show you a map in a second what I mean, but they grouped individual areas and a certain treaty applied to that entire area, regardless of all of the individuals, uh, individual First Nations signed on to it. If they got enough of them, they said that was a, a number treaty and everybody inside that area had the same rights and the same duties and obligations as that treaty held. And that you'll see it takes big chunks of Canada as it starts going west. Um, now I have to talk about the Indian Act. And the Indian Act is something very unique just to Canada. The Indian Act is passed in the late 1800s and it is very much an assimilationist policy. It had a number of very ugly features to it. Um, for instance, uh, a, a, an Indian woman, a First Nations woman, if she married a, a non-native, she lost her Indian status. She was no longer considered to be Indian. Um, if an Indian man married a non-Indian woman, then she gained status. Um, it treated men and women very unequally. It created the system by which the boarding schools could be created. It gave the, the, the government of Canada the jurisdiction to go into the homes and to be able to take out the kids and to send them off to these boarding schools in order to uh, basically transform them. Um, so the Indian Act is, is seen by the, the natives of Canada with, with a, a tremendous amount of sadness and a tremendous amount of, of frustration and anger. Um, up till 18, 1973, and this is very important, 1964, Tim Hortons gets founded. I believe that was integral to the next future because you had coffee for the first time everywhere. The, the number treaties now move off to recalibration and self-government. So in 1973, you have Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, the current prime minister's dad, you have the influence of the civil rights movement in the United States coming into Canada. You have a number of First Nations in Ontario and Quebec in particular, who are starting to assert their treaty rights, who are starting to uh, create you know, roadblocks and, and all kinds of issues. And the, the, for the first time, the people of Canada really are dealing with now this entire legacy for 100 years plus of how they've been treating the First Nations and are realizing that these programs, these policies are not working. 
They, they haven't been working. They're creating horrible situations and something needs to be done, but it was a, it's a, was a very slow evolutionary process. Um, the Indian Act is greatly reformed in 1982. Um, that's also the time when the Canadian, current Canadian constitution comes into place. Those, those two elements create the entire baseline by which uh, uh, most things are happening in Canada today. There was a series of court cases also in Canada in the late 90s were instrumental to where we are as well. And then today, the current era is reconciliation, where Canada is, as an official policy, is trying to make, make up for, make amends for, hear about the pain and suffering that it's caused, and bring the First Nations up to a place where they can effectively operate on par with uh, the provinces uh, and the territories. This is the Yukon. The Yukon, like Alaska, is an exception. Um, it is not in the same boat as the rest of Canada, and it has a, and it has a unique history as, as Alaska does. 1870, Prince Rupert's Land, or Rupert's Land, which was the legacy of the Hudson Bay Company, is purchased by Canada from the Hudson Bay Company and greatly expands Canada's claims into the Prairie Provinces, into what, the, what is now Northwest Territories, and some of BC, British Columbia, some of the Yukon. Uh, in the Yukon, the gold rush starts in 1896, and then the territory gets finally formed, broken off from the Northwest Territories. There was never any need for it before that because there were no settlers that were coming into the Yukon before that. The modern border isn't even established between the United States, the Yukon, and British Columbia until 1903. So this is the point in time where my great-great-grandmother was born in the Yukon and she married a, a fellow from the coast and they moved to the coast and my family uh, has been, been on this side ever since then. But again, we don't see the border as applying to us. The border happened. Um, land claims in the Yukon doesn't really begin until 1973. Well, you see up here, that's the end of the number of the Indian Act. You see that's the reconciliation period be starting. Um, also, the Yukon First Nations looked over at Alaska and saw the success of ANCSA, saw that the, the natives were over here, were able to get a, a land claim done. And that started their process, which took 20 years to come to fruition. In the Yukon, you have what's called the Umbrella Agreement, and it's an umbrella agreement in that it applies the process that's big, baked into it, or as they say over there, the process that's right baked into it applies to all of 14 of the First Nations. Now, they don't, they haven't all gone through this process even after almost 30 years. Um, each one of them has their own um, you know, internal uh, uh, determination of whether or not and how they want to begin the negotiation. Two of the 14 First Nations or three of the 14 First Nations still haven't completed their land claim process, and, uh, but 11 have. And so here we are today. So this again is the number of treaties and this is why the Yukon is different and a good part of D BC is different. You might say, well, what about none of it? Again, this is none of it up here, this big old uh, hunk of mass. None of it was outside of the number of treaties. And so none of it is its own exception, its own, its own uh, uh, program within the Canadian system. This line right here is the 60th parallel. And under Canadian law, the provinces which are below the 60th parallel here have a very different treatment with regard to the federal government as do the territories above it. That's, that plays, played a big part in why the Yukon land claims were able to happen because Ottawa was able to force uh, the hand of, of the Yukon territory to, to sit down at the table and negotiate. So what are we looking at in terms of, and this is, there's a lot here and I'm gonna go for it, through it very, very fast. Uh, the lower 48 tribes, they're land-based, they have jurisdiction over the lands, but up to the limit which Congress allows. That's a big point for both Alaska as well as the lower 48 is federalism. The courts and Congress determine how much powers the tribes have. The treaties can be obviated basically at the will of Congress. Some of them hold, some of them have been ignored over the history. Uh, what do the lower 48 tribes do in terms of their economies? Almost all of them are gaming now. About 90% of the lower 48 tribes have at least one casino. Some of those casinos are huge monstrosities that are very, very productive. Others of them are very small and all they are, are for jobs. They, there's a whole bunch of other things that tribes try to do, but that's a big picture capture of most of what the tribes are doing in the lower 48. Um, governance, they typically have uh, multiple, multiple uh, uh, tripartite, multiple part, uh, part branches of government direct democracies, very similar to the United States because of that era of 
uh, constitutions being formed and the constitutions all replicated to a certain degree what the US constitution looked like. In Alaska, we have a little bit different. I'm sure it's the most familiar to the folks who are watching. We have sovereign governments, the tribes, but they're subject matter jurisdiction. They have the ability to decide uh, uh, issues as determined by certain laws of Congress for their people, but they don't have a territory over which they, they, they exert jurisdiction. The land, that territory is controlled by the ANCs and the ANCs have tribal rights and they have tribal powers, but again, it's determined by Congress on a case by case basis. We have both the federalism, but also in the case of the ANCs were regulated by the state of Alaska. The ANC's primary econo economic activities are resource development and then government contracting. A number of them have some small scale in region type of commercial activities. Um, the tribes, not that much different from the lower 48. The ANCs have board of directors. They're basically direct dem democracies and how, how the voting occurs. The lands are governed by internal policies of the corporations and those policies limit what we can do based upon what any other private party can do. So that's an important distinction between what happens with Alaska and the lower 48. As far as Canada is concerned, um, you really have a split again between the non-Yukon First Nations, and I really should say the non-self-governing First Nations, and then the Yukon First Nations or self-governing First Nations with land claims. Um, the non-Yukon First Nation, non, the non-self-governing First Nations, they really have their powers that are after that, that amended Indian Act the powers are under negotiation on a case by case basis. So, so certain First Nations over in Quebec, over in Ontario have very different abilities about how they can regulate what happens on reserve compared to First Nations in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, most of them, uh, if they do have any economic activity and the reserves tend to be very, very uh, small in terms of economic activity, there's, there's some natural resource activity in particularly in the prairies but most of them are, are their, their entire uh, system of their entire economy is government transfers. Uh, for the Yukon First Nations, this is very, very different. The Yukon First Nations have land. They have sovereign ability over that land. My First Nation can pass laws and those laws apply to anybody who, would, who goes on the, the, the First Nation lands. Um, they have land claim agreements, but those land claim agreements are not dependent on direct negotiation with the federal government. The land claim agreements are actually directly negotiated with the crown. Canada, as you'll recall, its sovereign is the Queen of England. And so that's the crown. And so all of our agreements are directly with essentially the Queen of England and not with Canada itself, although Canada is a party. And then we have this notion of the laws of general application. We can make whatever laws we want on our land, but if we are silent on a particular law, the law inside the Yukon applies to our lands. The land, uh, any of the laws passed by the Parliament of Canada applies to our lands as well. So until we actually come forth and say something definitively on the topic, the laws of general application apply. Now, how do we run our economy? Well, our economy uh, is really run by the trusts. The trusts were created in the late 90s after land claims, after we started receiving money. And the IRS of Canada, Revenue Canada, came and made a determination that either the First Nations in the Yukon needed to be governments with businesses, and then they could be taxed as a business, or they needed to create an arm's length separation, and the governments would focus on government activities, and then any of the businesses or investments would be uh, invested in, it would be run in a different organization called, this, called a trust, and that allows for essentially tax-free activities to happen. So the trusts are created in the late 90s, and those operate akin to what an ANC is, but not exactly. The, the individual citizens of the First Nations have no direct ownership of the trust. The First Nation itself owns the trust, but it has to have an arm's length relationship. You vote for somebody on council, uh, the chief, what have you, they can't tell the trust what to do. The trust has to have an independent decision-making set of powers. Um, Let's see. So that's basically where we're at. I'm, I'm blowing through hundreds of years of history and tremendous amounts of information. So I apologize for it. Um, so where are we at right now? So how can you compare how things are going after you know, 300 years, 250 years? Well, there's the old external uh, determinations of uh, how economic development happens. Well, within Canada, within the United States, within Alaska, there's large disparities depending upon what you're looking at. GDP per capita, life expectancies, 
the population totals of some of these communities still aren't even back to where they were pre-Western contact. Um, educational attainment can be very different place to place. Some places have a lot of people who've gone on to college, who've gone into trades, who've gone into those things, and others have virtually nobody who's graduated even from high school. Unemployment and poverty, it's all over the place. And this is between Canada and the United States. This is uh, within Canada, within the United States. Um, there's very wide disparities. Um, political status, you know, so how well are the First Nations, how well are the tribes regarded by other sovereigns, the Canada, the United States? That has definitely improved, I would say, specifically over the last 30, 40 years. I think that the tribes are held as legitimate governments. The First Nations certainly in Canada are upheld as legitimate governments with, with their own sovereignty. Now, how well is, are the citizens participating? Well, you can look at voting rates, and voting rates tend to be on par with what uh, local government voting rates would be. A general election here in Anchorage, maybe you get 20, 25% participation. That's pretty typical in most of the elections that I've seen. Internally, how are we doing? Well, a lot of it has to do with continuing our traditional way of life, the way of life that we had before Western contact, and that's been a mixed bag. Some languages are doing very, very well. Some people can speak their language in the home, in their community. Most people can't. Um, most of the cultural practices are being carried forward as best they can. Um, some of them are having to go through periods of change. Um, the communities, um, some communities have had seen massive diasporas. Some communities are very, very uh, well cohered and, and look and function very similar to how they did pre-Western contact. So again, a mixed bag. And then finally, what, what are our own expectations of ourselves and our vis-a-vis -vis our government? Um, some places really depend on the government for jobs and for an economy, and so they expect the government to function very, very well. Other places, less so. Um, do they look at, do individual communities look at the government and expect it to provide them with subsidies, would be able to supplement their way of life? Some places, yes. Some places, no. Virtually everywhere, though, expects the government, whether it's the form of a First Nation, a tribe, or an ANC, to act as a leader, to be that liaison, to be that point of the spear in articulating rights and, and advocating on behalf of the people. That very much is, is true everywhere. So a few idle speculations on the future. I'll move into this very quickly. Um, I think the lower 48 tribes are going to continue to see their political and economic power go up. It's gone up tremendously over the last 10 years, and I don't see any reason why that's going to slow down. Alaska tribes, a lot of it begins with what happens with land into trust. That's the process by which tribes in Alaska can take land and then form reservations. Will that ever restart? I don't know. Will Alaska tribes <clears throat> start moving into re re uh, regionalization with each other and start, uh, they already share services with under nonprofit arms. Will they start actually commingling their sovereignty? That was something that was contemplated 20, 30 years ago. I don't know. Are they gonna reform their constitution? Some uh, tribes up here, if you leave the village, you're no longer a citizen. Some of the constitutions haven't been uh, updated since the 1930s. That's still something I don't know. The ANCs, within the ANCs, I think the regionals, the 12 regional corporations, their influence is only going to increase within Alaska over time. All of them are very successful business operations. The villages, on the other hand, is a much, much different story. It's a mixed bag. There's some very successful village corporation, and then there's a lot who are just struggling to get by. Uh, with what's happening with uh, revenue sharing amongst all the corporations later this decade, that's a pivot point in the history of ANGSA. And then also climate change. Um, as climate change affects Alaska and regions differently, if you start talking about needing to uh, change uh, the village sites to be able to add additional pieces and parts to the villages, you're gonna end up impacting the village corporation's lands because they, they're the lands that actually surround the village. On the Canada side, um, and then finally, I, my speculation is that as it has been the case for the last 30, 40 years, the major shifts in policy, major shifts in the direction of what happens are gonna be driven by courts, not by legislatures. Uh, there's a lot of political, uh, um, let's say, I don't wanna say radioactivity, but there's there's definitely an, uh, trying to be sensitive to the, what the status quo is. And many, uh, you know, Congress will take an incremental approach. They don't wanna make major changes happen as far as policy is concerned. Canada, the Yukon, Reconciliation, I think that it's going to continue, and but it's going to be a very slow process, a 20-year process, 30-year process, and I think eventually most of the First Nations in Canada are going to resemble what's going on inside the Yukon. 
Um, land claims below the 60th parallel, that on the other hand is going to depend upon the economic conditions of the province. British Columbia right now has 49 First Nations, only six or seven of whom have completed their land claims, and it has absolutely no interest in completing the land claim process, and Ottawa can't force it. If there was a point in time where the economic conditions, kind of like Alaska with the pipeline, were, were available, then maybe they would restart the land claims process. Uh, the Yukon First Nations, the trusts will continue to grow in power. They are very successful, akin to what the ANCs are. And the, and the First Nation governments themselves will remain a, a, an important force in the Yukon. The, for, the Yukon territorial government has a lot of, uh, of uh, partnerships with First Nations. It, they, they give the First Nations a, a, a lot of heed, and they will remain a very vital part of what the Yukon does. But And again, in Canada, like the United States, major changes are going to happen driven by courts, not by the legislatures. So uh, I apologize for the speed. I apologize uh, if, I, if that was a 60 mile an hour uh, uh, fun fest, uh, but there's a lot to it. So I'm going to leave you with uh, you know, the traditional thank yous. So good to see you. Good to see And to ask you some news. Thank you, Nathan. That was a lot of information and um, so well given in such a short amount of time. I know I was taking a bunch of pictures of your slides. I'm hoping you can share them with us. We'll put them up on Facebook. We'll share them out so that we can especially see the timeline that you have of the different um, areas. I'd like to bring on Dr. Paul Dunscombe to ask our first question. Paul. Greetings. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. McCallan, for a uh, really fascinating presentation. And you know, fast as it was, it was quite fascinating. Um, so my question deals with, and this was something that um, I had encountered on a presentation regarding Alaska Natives from uh, a younger scholar. Uh, and it really is how one kind of assesses the significance and consequences of ANCSA. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of generational divide in the perception of ANCSA re regarding whether it's, you know, an act of native agency or if it's a continuation of, you know, uh, federal policies of um, sequestration of um, because it provides ownership, but kind of takes away sovereignty. Um, is there a kind of is what are the perceptions of ANCSA uh, between generations of Alaska Natives? Yeah, I'd say that there's uh, four to maybe five distinct generations of Alaska Natives pursuant to ANCSA. You have the 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 generation of uh, Alaska Natives who were who remember before ANCSA, uh, for whom ANCSA was wildly transformative in their lives. They remember the old village lifestyle. They remember not having any natives having associations with the ownership of land. They remember the era where natives had no voice in any sort of policy matters. They remember when the BIA meant boss Indians around. That there's that group, and for them, ANCSA has been you know, on the whole, a wildly successful effort. You have the next generation, which is my mom's generation, for whom ANCSA happened when they were kids. And they had the first real blessings of economic vitality. The pipeline boom happened and ANCSA happened. And for them, uh, ANCSA means jobs and dividends. And so it's primarily an economic driver. My generation, we look at it as this, that, what, it's a legacy of our grandparents. My parents' generation, the, 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 our grandparents were so young, they stayed in leadership and continue to be in leadership. Then my parents' generation, for the most part, were not actively involved in leadership. My generation is now coming in as the next real generation of leaders, defining and redefining ANCSA. The generation beneath me is really the first generation who has more of a critical eye towards ANCSA. They're the first generation who were primarily enrolled in tribes. And so they have a first allegiance. They've been waiting on becoming shareholders. And so ANCSA for them is things that their parents and their grandparents do to a large degree. And then you have my kids' generation for whom they really don't understand any of it, their kids. So uh, that's, 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 that's a short generalization. Uh, I thank you very much for that. And I would also note that it, it is one of the things about Alaska, but also, you know, clearly of uh, the Yukon as well, that you just can't understand what Alaska is these days without understanding ANCSA and its significance and how much, you know, Alaska differs from either, you know, 
native in the lower 48, but also if you think about the Ainu in Japan or something like that, it's uh, really quite a remarkable um, spectrum. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Paul. And now I'd like to bring on Fran. So great to see you for the next question. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was fabulous. I, I really have to say, <clears throat> I would like to listen to it all over again because it did go by pretty quickly. And I think uh, many of us would love to have the opportunity to absorb more of it. So I do hope it is. Uh, it was recorded. So two quick questions. One, could you talk a little bit more about the implications of putting land into trust? But I, I think most of us have a very unclear understanding of both how that would work and what difference it would make. And my second question relates to fish and game management, fish and, and particularly fish and wildlife management, as you know, was a pretty hot topic during the time when we were trying to get a constitutional amendment passed. Uh, and I'm just curious whether that is still somehow embedded in either the land into trust movement or a different approach entirely. Thank you. Thank, and thank you for those questions. Um, so, you know, land into trust is a, a federal uh, controlled process through the Department of Interior, whereby tribes can apply to have their lands taken under ownership on their behalf by the federal government. And those lands move from what's called a fee simple status, a status that pretty much they can buy and sell them, to now being owned by the federal government on behalf of the individual tribe for the benefit of that tribe. Remember that the individual Indians are, uh, function as still in many ways as wards of the state. And so there's a trust and a guardianship responsibility that occurs. Uh, what that means in modern terms, though, is that the tribes now have the ability to have territorial jurisdiction over the parcels that are taken under trust on their behalf. So they can pass laws, their laws that apply in the state of Alaska's laws, for instance, would be excluded. So that's the biggest difference to land into trust is, is the tribes moving from subject matter jurisdiction, Indian child welfare, for instance, now moving to territorial jurisdiction where they can make de decisions uh, on the individual villages if they want to, for instance, exclude somebody, if they want to have a system of justice or system of government that's different from the state system. That's the biggest, the biggest, the biggest difference and the biggest process that would change. As far as fish and game, uh, wildlife, you know, that's probably the biggest weakness of ANGSA is that it unilaterally um, declared that, that Alaska Natives have no Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights. The Yukon Indians, my First Nation over there, that was a core portion of our negotiations on our land claims. So I can go to the Yukon right now and I can hunt and fish with basically impunity um, in my traditional territory, uh, but only, only held up to the regulations of my First Nation. I have perfected harvesting rights the moment I go to the Yukon, the moment I cross the border. I have nothing on this side. And so I think over time, we've that's that's going to be my generations. I think our next great challenge is finding a, a restitution, finding a new equilibrium point in and around uh, subsistence in Alaska. Also, good to see you again, Fran. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Here's a question that's coming in through our chat function or chat feature. It says, is it possible the Alaska legislature will consider the formal recognition of Alaska tribes? If they do pass such legislation, what would that mean for Alaska tribes? It was House Bill 123. I mean, I think the, the legislature is going to evaluate it. I think there's also a push to have it as a referendum before the voters. So even if there is some sort of political impasse or uh, political um, aversion towards the recognition, then uh, there could very well be that the, uh, the citizens of Alaska are going to have the opportunity to decide on the question. Um, what it would do uh, is, is more symbolic than it is uh, uh, powerful. It, it, would, it would validate it to, to, uh, to ever, all the people of Alaska's eyes the co-equal status of the individual tribes in Alaska. And it would help, I think, a lot in the relationship forming and in and, and, and the reconciliation to a, lot, a big degree between the state of Alaska and the tribes. The state of Alaska over the history of it has had 
uh, I'm going to say a, a bit of a contra controversial adversarial relationship with First Nation, with the, the tribes here. And so I think it would go a long way towards healing that uh, adversarial position. Um, the tribes are here, whether Alaska wants to recognize them or not, but I think it would go a long way towards bridging the divide if, 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 they, if the, the state, either through the citizens or through the legislature, actually went in and, and did it formally. And now I'd like to call on Jen Motika for our next question. Jen. Hi, Jen, you're on, you're on mute. I, I, I'd love to even read lips. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks so much for what is unbe unbelievably informative presentation. Um, really a lot of things that I think a lot of us had no idea about. We're not taught it, we don't learn it. The access to that information isn't just out there. Um, so as someone who isn't part of the native community, but absolutely believes in, in the progress that is being made, how can we help as an ally? What, can, what things can be done to help promote the culture, help, um, or is it best stay out of the way because it's not, not our fight to fight. I mean, what's, what's the... I, I, I appreciate the question, number one. You know, I, we, the Native community can be insular, um, and that's been because we've had to uh, dig a lot of uh, foxholes and protect ourselves from attacks from the outside. And an important part of us continuing and maintaining our own integrity is reaching out and working with as many other groups as we possibly can. So, you know, a, as an ally, the, the best thing you can do is be there. Um, there's points in time that are coming down in the future where we're going to need people to stand up and say, look, this might not be in my particular best interest. This might actually be adversarial to my best interest, but I still think that for the larger, you know, benefit of, of our nation, of our state, of our community, these people over here need to have X or Y or whatever it is. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's not a zero sum game as some people want to characterize it. Um, you know, the, 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 the Alaska natives provide a lot of benefit to the state of Alaska. We bring home a lot of money. We bring home a lot of jobs. We create a lot of jobs. We're out there doing things that are beneficial. And so it's, it, it's, it's a fallacy to see it as, well, if they, if it's something that it's taking away something from me. So right. the best thing to do is vote when we need the votes and uh you know clap when we need when we need when we need the applause great thank you here's another question from the chat it says jumping back to your generalized overview could you please explain nunavut what it is and how it's working out <laughs> none of it uh you know, there's a great jim gaffigan uh, comedy routine about uh about canada and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the joke goes, you know, that the people have stood up and said, you know, we want our place to be called none of it. And the people in Ottawa goes, uh, I didn't realize people live there. Um, none of it is, uh, is a, it's its own special place within Canadian law. Um, it, it broke out from the Northwest Territories in the late 90s. Um, they have a land claims as well as the Territorial uh, Act kind of running in conjunction with each other. Most of the people in none of it are uh, Inuit. I'd say it's probably like 95% Inuit with a population of like, I wanna say 60,000, 70,000 people. And so they have their land claims and then their territorial government kind of running coextensive. It's it's most similar in the Alaska circumstance to uh, the North Slope Borough where you have the North Slope Borough as well as ANCSA running coextensive to each other. Um, and so none of it has sort of a special status where it's it's mostly one people group as opposed to like the Yukon where you have you know eight distinct people groups broken up into 14 First Nations and that was just not something that was practicable. So Nunavut, its own cool place. And I think we have time for one more question and that's coming from Dick Lefevre. Dick, over to you. Sorry about that. Uh, hang on. Uh, okay. There we are. There we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering, Nathan. The, uh, the question was brought up earlier about generations. Um, Anx has been a tremendous success, and a lot of young leaders, including yourself, have come up through the ranks. What do you see happening in the next 
generation or two that'll take ANCSA to an even different level? Um, I think that the 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 continued uh, dialogue and continued uh, harmonization with the tribes, uh, what I like to call our, our own reconciliation, is probably the most important thing that we have to accomplish over time. Um, uh, Anx is going to go through. Uh, Anx has gone through several phases already. There's another phase coming up here in the next ten years, particularly on the village level, when the seven I revenue sharing really drops off, and how do the individual village corporations uh, manage through that point in time. Um, but I think like the, 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 what leaders, my generation, the generation beneath me can really focus on is increasing the harmony between the tribes and the ANCs. Uh, it's when, when we fight amongst ourselves uh, is when we're able to be uh, carved up, sliced and diced. And so we need to make sure that we have uh, uh, that, that, that balance, that togetherness, that interwovenness between, between both sides of the house so that we're walking in step, pulling in Southeast the expression, we're in the same, we're in the same canoe pulling in the same direction. Thank you. It looks like we actually have time for one more. And, and there's a question that's just come through that I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you can answer it much better than I can. And that is, were all the ANCs awarded lands funds equally? If not, what was the formula? Oh, it was random. They just put them all, all the, all the balls to a hopper and said, all right, you get this much. Um, there were um, two primary drivers for the determination of how much land uh, each corporation received. Um, there were uh, uh, the regional lands and then the village lands. Um, the villages uh, received a certain number of townships, and a township is either 23 or 32,000 acres. There were so many townships you received based upon your original enrollment. So if you had um, less than 100 uh, enrollees, your village corporation received 66,000 acres. It must be 32 because it goes like 66, 94, and then like 120. Um, and so it scaled up in terms of the number of townships and the most that a village corporation could receive, I want to say it was like 180,000 acres. And so you take that anywhere from 65 to 170, 180,000 acres, and you multiply it by the 229, 227 original village corporations. And that comes up to a number about uh, 16, 17 million acres, I want to say what it was. And then the village or the regional corporations had a number of pools of lands. The biggest pool of lands was about 20 million acres that was uh, divided up amongst the regionals on what's called the land lost formula. Now, Southeast Alaska is excluded from this because it had its own special treatment. But basically, the numerator was how big is your region? The denominator is how big is Alaska? Whatever that fraction is, you got that many acres out of the pool that was available for the regional corporations. So you had a formula driven approach depending upon enrollment with the villages. You had a land loss driven approach with the regionals, except for Southeast with Sea Alaska. Sea Alaska had a very specific number that it just got assigned. Okay. I'm really trying not to go over, Nathan. There are so many good questions. I am going to throw in one more, and I promise this is the last one, but this is really an important one here in Alaska. How can public school teachers best support Indigenous student success? Um, I think the best, I mean, I have two kids in the public school system. I was a product of the public school system. Um, the, the best thing they can do is just to value them for who they are and be, understand that they're part of a larger community. Um, we as Native people, you know, exist uh, seemingly as individuals, but the reality is, is that we're always eternally part of a group. I'm who I am because I'm a member of my clan, not because of who I am as an individual. I'm a member of who I am because of who I am as my family. And so when you're treating with the individual students, you're not just treating with that single individual person, although the kid is the one manifestation in front of you. You're treating with their family, you're treating with their, their village, you're treating with their community, you're treating with their culture. And so if you take that approach to it, I think a lot more Native kids will, will be able to succeed in, in our public school systems. 
Thank you so very much, Nathan, for joining us today and for all of your, answering all of these questions and giving us this presentation and agreeing to send us all your slides. There was so much information. I can't wait to share that through the World Affairs Council and we'll have this available on YouTube. I know people are asking about it. We'll share it and please share it with others so they too can hear this wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for joining here today at the Alaska World Affairs Council and for supporting our commitment to bringing quality educational programs to you and our passion to increase all of our global competency. If you have any comments or suggestions, please send them our way. We have another program coming up next week, National Resilience and a National Security Issue from Australia. We join us, retired Air Vice Marshal, John Blackburn and local legend retired General Howie Chandler will be moderating this program. We appreciate your support during these China challenging financial times and we appreciate all of your donations online in any amount and we look forward to seeing you in person and on our virtual programs. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon.